It is a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Charles Fattel and his son, Chaz Fattel. Yes, sir. To meet you. Yes, and uh, let me read his uh, bio. Mr. Fattel, a lawyer by education, has been in the commercial real estate business since the mid-80s. Having worked with Trammell Crow and Ritt, Mr. Fattel was responsible for the management and leasing of significant portfolios of office and retail properties. Since 1996, his firm has specialized in the representation of medical and dental professionals with their commercial real estate needs. In addition, he has professionally represented several different healthcare institutions. Moreover, his firm has leased millions of square feet of medical office space for a who's who list of medical office building owners. Also, Mr. Fattel is recognized as an industry leader in healthcare real estate and is a featured speaker in healthcare summits in Washington, D.C., Pennsylvania, and New York. Having worked with hundreds of doctors, dentists, and healthcare providers over the years, Mr. Fattel has learned the ins and out of medical dental real estate. Since 1996, he has represented medical dental real estate transactions in excess of $800 million. No commercial real estate broker in the Mid-Atlantic region is more experienced in the skillful representation of healthcare professionals. Mr. Fattel graduated from the University of Michigan in 1982, so you're a Wolverine. I'm a Wolverine and the University of Toledo College of Law in 1985. His son, Chaz Patel, graduated from the Pennsylvania State University in 2012 with degrees in political science and history. He has been with the firm since spring of 2013 after learning the commercial real estate business under his father, Charles, and since developed strong relationships with many dental providers and vendors alike, all of whom are vital to starting a practice. He has vast experience in tenant representation, along with a quickly growing portfolio of listing for major real estate investment groups such as Douglas Development, CVS Healthcare Properties, Bro Real Estate Group, and Weston Capital Group. Chaz has leased and sold over 200,000 square feet of retail, medical, and office space since starting his career in commercial real estate and highly values his client satisfaction and service. I want to thank you guys. Um, you're, so you guys out of Bethesda, yes, sir. And this is um, this is we're filming this between uh, Christmas and uh, New Year's, and it's so lucky living in Phoenix because you got all these wonderful people, um, these townies from around the country that are down here to vacation. So I take it it's war golf is better here than Bethesda it's at this time of year. Yes. Here. Yeah, so I want to I want to um, I, I I appreciate you coming on the show because the bottom line is Dennis went to eight years of college and all they would have learned is root canals, fillings, and crowns. Mm -hmm. And they, it's not that they don't give a crap about all this, they just never think about all this stuff. And then when they finally show up and they got a couple of questions, who are they gonna talk to, their cousin Eddie? That's right. Um, so I just wanna throw out a, a couple of uh, um, questions. One of the first things they think is, uh, you know, dentists, like most businesses, they don't move around a lot. Right. So a lot of the, when I'm in dental schools, a lot of these people are saying, well, if I'm 25, and I'm going back to Bumblebutt, Kansas. Why would I rent? Should, should I own or should I rent? So their first question is they're saying, since you're probably gonna, I mean, who's gonna change their office when you got all these patients coming back every six months? So should they rent or should they own? Should they get in the real estate business and own a building or should they just rent and let professionals do that? So it's a multi multifaceted question. Uh, first thing is ultimately cost. So that if you're in a market, and the market rent, let's say for a couple thousand square feet, would be $5,000 per month. In theory, if you can own that space for around $5,000 a month, I would say the answer is should definitely be yes to your question. But it might be, depending on where you are, it might be $10,000 a month, it might be $12,000 a month. So then the question becomes, can you be a competitive dentist if you're paying double in overhead to own versus what everybody else is paying in rent. So that's the first question. Second question is, are you gonna be able to get the loan to buy your property? Because obviously most dentists have a lot of student debt. You're gonna typically, as a startup, you're gonna quit your well-paying associateship job to start a practice. So you're in, in initially gonna have no income. So, and you probably don't have a lot of collateral because you've been, with all that student debt, you've been an associate building a family. So, you know, can you even afford to do it but the, the, and then I guess the other question to answer what you said is, yeah, you don't usually move, but sometimes you do. Sometimes that first office, maybe it's not quite big enough. Maybe it's too big. You missed the mark a little bit in terms of location. So we, we typically find the startup dentist 
for the most part, is going to sign a lease. Because if you're if you're 30 and you sign a 10-year lease, at 40, you're still going to work another 25 years. So now if you know where the model is and where you want to be, you save a little bit of money, now's probably a better time to purchase. But the other answer to your question, at, at the risk of not answering it, is it also depends where you are. Because if you're, if you're in midtown Manhattan, you're probably not going to buy your space because a medical office condo is $1,000 a square foot. So Seriously? So 50, yes, easily. So 1,500 square feet is a million and a half dollars plus build out. That's a lot of money. If you're out here, yeah, you might. Some parts of the country you can do ground up. You can actually buy the land and get somebody to help you develop a small little building. But East Coast, West Coast, Chicago, uh, most of the Texas markets, most of the California markets, it's just cost prohibitive. So, so the answer is maybe, and, and we can help you evaluate all that. It's also, it's also a cost of funds issue. Right now, money has been historically low. We have clients borrowing money at three and three quarters. Rates have just recently crested 4%, but you and I are old enough to know that's still cheap. You know, Jimmy Carter money was 21%. So that's another factor. What are your costs of funds? You know, so th there's a lot of issues to, to look at. If it really depends on your reference, because when I um, was a senior in high school in 1980, I was in Kansas, and some of my friends' dads, uh, interest rates hit 21%. That's right. And some of my friends' dads lost the family farm Correct. that had been in the farm for three or four 100%, generations 100%. and went out in the barn and blew their head off. And then when I bought my first house, I thought I was so smart because the seller had finance at 14%, right. and I was getting in at 12, right. and, I, and my frame of mind was 21%, and I'm getting in at 12, and then you hear these people complaining about rates today. Okay, so my homies, they get out of dental school. They go back to Parsons, Kansas, and they say, well, I want to be here because um, they're thinking, what, what's a better decision? Would it be better to lease to be next to the big grocery store or would it be better to be across the street and own the little brick building? What would you say to them? Part of that depends on, on the type of dental professional. So Chaz and I are finding that almost, almost every general dentist we work with now is looking for that retail visibility, that storefront, shopping center, drive-by, walk-by, synergy with other retail tenants. We find that a lot with pediatric dentistry. We're starting to find more and more orthodontists who want that synergy, I think, with the moms and the, and the families and, and the shopping center. Yeah. Now, we still find, for the most part, oral surgeons, periodontists, prostodontists, endodontists are still more often to go into a professional building where they're relying on referrals from the local dentist, and so they're not looking for the retail visibility. So that that just depends. and and the specialists are getting B to B referrals. Their their referrals are a, a dentist is saying drive to that spot, right? But the dentist is getting B to C, right? 100%. And I, I and some some of these dentists will complain about the the rent rate. They'll say, well, it's so much money to be next to that, and I say, and it's so much cheaper to go in the medical dental building. I say, well, if the medical dental building costs a dollar a month, and right where all the people are is $2 a month, then don't look at that extra dollar as rent, look at it as marketing. And if that dollar is 2,000, if you're in 2,000 feet with five ops, and it's $2,000 a year in the scheme of things, compared to what you're paying for internet advertising, that's nothing. So we agree, and we're, and we're seeing that, especially the younger dentists almost exclusively want the retail. So, hear that. And that's changed. We've been doing this 22 years. And 22 years ago, very few dentists wanted a retail spot and now and the other thing that's changed is the the retail real estate world has changed the biggest retailer in the world is amazon.com so a lot of your shopping centers now have more vacancy than they used to have because so many retailers are relying on the internet so because of vacancy now the landlord says okay a dentist is going to stay forever they're going to pay their rent on time why not so that's helped dentists to go into shopping centers as well. However, the caveat is most good retailers uh, want the retail tenants to pay what's called percentage rents, which basically means you pay your rent, and then as your business is successful, a piece of your business goes to the landlord. So you need to make sure that you don't let the landlord, if you're a dentist, you don't want to let the landlord get a piece of your business because Starbucks and Chipotle and all the traditional retailers, in addition to rent, are paying percentage rents to the landlord. Wow. Yep. So one of the problems, you know, in my 29 years of watching dentists come out of school, 
and floating to the top versus having crazy careers. Um, the biggest standout is they were voraciously um, to continue education, which is why I do this podcast. I mean, I'm trying to give them an hour of CE every day for free mm -hmm. on their damn phone. Mm -hmm. But the other two ingredients were the ones that were humble and hungry. But most dentists, physicians, and lawyers are no arrogant and entitled. So if you're an arrogant doctor, you know it all. So when you go get a job as an associate, you don't need a lawyer to read over this contract. I mean, I'm a dentist. I'm the smartest guy in the room. And they just don't get help. So I, what I want to ask you is most of my, the arrogant know-it-alls are just going to see the space. It says, if you want to rent this, call this number. And then they're going to think that person's representing them and they're looking out for all their best interests. Next thing you know, Doc signed the lease. Well, you're a lawyer. Tell them why it's better to be humble and hungry instead of know-it-all arrogant and entitled. So, so that's a great question. And we often, Chaz and I are talking about it coming out here to see you that sometimes we'll hear the dentist say, well. Sorry, are you that's allergic fine. to cats? Some, <laughs> sorry. Some, some, <laughs> sometimes the dentist will say, um, I don't want to upset the landlord. You know, we've actually heard that before, yeah. you know, kind of like mm -hmm. the, the landlord is my buddy. So why don't you ask, answer Howard's question. Talk to Howard about why, who these landlords are and why it's so imperative to have professional representation. Well, I mean, a lot of dentists who are listening who probably own their own real estate are, uh, maybe you're retired, maybe you're renting to another dentist. So put yourself in, in your own shoes for a minute and you're, you're going to do what's best for yourself being an owner and collecting rent and being a landlord. So the last thing you're going to want to do is uh, work with someone on the dentist's behalf who's going to try to get them a better deal and they understand the market. Because, I mean, now all of a sudden you're, you're at working at a disadvantage and you know that you're going to have to take some losses, whether it's in rent. Maybe you're going to have to write a bigger check for, for improvements to the space. Maybe you're going to have to give them more free rent, depending on the market, because supply and demand. I mean, if the market says you sign a 10-year lease, you get six months of free rent. The dentist who claims they know it all, I mean, it, it, it explains itself. They don't. And the broker or the lease negotiator who's working on your half does know that. So they're going to be your fiduciary and do their best to, to get you the best deal based on the market. And, and, and we've just seen all that exposed on the all these dentist 401ks. It's, it started with the news and it was on the uh, John Oliver's. Um, mm -hmm. this last week tonight and everybody started looking at their, their 401ks and like, oh my God, this, this guy's making a hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> you know, a decade off my little dental office. And then, you know, so they just don't know. They, dentists know what they know. They just never know what they don't know. And, and people don't know what they don't know. And landlords are, are very sophisticated, intelligent yeah. people and they make the rules cause they own the buildings. And so it doesn't, you know, like you said, you go to college, you go to dental school, you're very tunnel vision. There's so much you have to learn. How could you learn the commercial real estate business? You can't. So why would you even want to go toe to toe with a professional who he, he or she, they own the building. You've got people who've been in the commercial real estate business for a century. They have a broker working for them, representing their interests, who's trying to do what's best for them. So we understand that our clients are all doctors, dentists, and optometrists. So we respect their intelligence. We got in the business. My dad, Chaz's grandpa, is, is a retired pediatrician. So we understand the doctor, dentist, psychology. Yeah, different mentality. But, yeah. but, but, and we know you're super bright people. I couldn't, I mean, I got to see in organic chemistry in Michigan, and I was done. That was the end of my medical career. <laughs> but you don't, but you don't know commercial real estate. And how could you? Because our business, you know, residential real estate, I'm not, I wouldn't bash a residential agent, but a lot of that information is readily available. So Realtor.com, Zillow, all these other, you can go on, you can look up what houses sell for, you can do virtual tours. Commercial's very clandestine. It's very secretive amongst the brokers and the landlords. So there's no way, even if you're a super bright dentist, you can find this information. So what happens inevitably is, the landlord wants this and the dentist is smart enough to say well that's too much you don't really know what it should be but you just know if he or she is the landlord they want too much so what happens is the landlord says this the dentist says that you end up somewhere in between that's what happens without representation the problem is maybe 
the floor is down here. And you just left all that money on the table. And like you said, if you're there for 35 years, it starts to really add up. You're paying 20, 30 percent over the market for 35 years. That's a lot of money. And so it just, you know, there's just there's no way you can know. It's it's very so. So your website is <clears throat> medicalanddentalspace.com. So medical and a and d not ampersand dentalspace.com. So if some if one of my homies is thinking about you know he's right now he's working at corporate he's an associate somewhere he's got his eye on something what states do you do you work in? So we have so we are Health Pro Realty Group is licensed in Maryland D.C. Virginia and Pennsylvania. We are part of an alliance with 375 offices worldwide. We're part of a global alliance. So if you're in if you're in Scottsdale and you're an associate and you want to open an office, you deal with us. We work in tandem with a local Scottsdale commercial real estate company. And between, we, we've done this for 22 years. So between our knowledge of how to do it and a local boots on the ground brokerage firm, we help you get the best possible deal. And you have to have that local knowledge. In our market, in, in Maryland, even even if you go from one town to another, the deals are significantly different. Out here, Scottsdale, North Scottsdale, Phoenix, it's all different. And you only know by doing other transactions in that specific market. There's no substitute for that. By the way, everybody thinks, everybody always, when I go around, they say, oh, do you live in Scottsdale? I say, no, I live in Phoenix. Like, oh, like, I'm sorry. <laughs> is Phoenix ain't bad either, Phoenix is, is it? Yeah, it's it's absolutely absolutely I, I love Phoenix. It's uh, I, uh, uh, so, so, uh, so if... What exa- Okay, so if she goes to medicalanddentalspace.com, um, how does this work? I mean, wh- what do you actually do? What do you actually provide? So, what, what services so do you do? So a typical case scenario, okay, so uh, an associate is, is, is in, a, in a, a group, and they've decided, okay, now he or she wants to be their own boss. So they'll come to us. Most of our clients we find who are serious about this have done their homework like you did before you came out here, and you have a pretty good idea where you want to be. You know, if, if we get a call from somebody who says, I want to be in the Northeast, I want to be on the West Coast, I want to be in the Sun Belt, it's really hard to help that person because you can imagine the, the, the number, you know, the typical dentist, 1,500 to 2,500 square feet. You can imagine the number of opportunities if you were, you, you couldn't do it. So our clients who are serious and and are real about what they want to do have a pretty good idea. They usually say to us they know it by a town or a zip code or a cross street. I mean, they know where they want to be. So they tell us that's what they want to do. We'll talk to them. We'll understand that they have restrictive covenants because years ago, many, many years ago, I helped a young dentist and we got all the way down to the goal line and he couldn't sign the lease because he had a three mile radius restrictive covenant and the space we were going to sign a lease on was like two and a half miles. So, so now that's the first question we ask. Then, you know, we go over, should it be retail? Should it be office? Should you lease it? Should you own it? We go through all that. We understand. Then we'll help them identify a myriad of opportunities within where they want to be. Okay. And then, so your question is, so after we help them identify and find it, then we go look at these spaces. Ultimately, there's always, what, two or three that usually possibly could work. So then we'll negotiate them against one another to get the dentist the best possible deal. So that's the first thing we do. Yeah, and in addition to, to LoopNet, which I'm sure a lot of dentists have some minor experience using, we have a system called CoStar, which is essentially the commercial equivalent to the uh, multiple listing service for, for houses. So we have access to CoStar all across the country. So we get a larger volume of opportunities in that market you want to be in, which allows us to reach out to these landlords and say, hey, will you even do a dentist or an orthodontist? Because a lot of times they won't because it's just it's, it's a lot more stress on the building, whether it's uh, for the plumbing or maybe they just don't want the foot traffic or really the, the, the hand holding, quite frankly, because okay. there's a lot more demand uh, from a medical dental professional than there would be from an office user. And, and the local market knowledge is huge because our our agents, our boots on the ground in a particular town, will know the landlords who are open to dental. They may even know of an empty dental space mm-hmm. where somebody retired or, God forbid, whatever. But you know, you just said something that um, I remember reading in uh, Phil Knight's book, the founder of Nike. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody, yeah. everybody told me, he said, well, 
you can't do business in China. They, they'll, they'll, they'll run you to the ground. And the dentist, he just said that he gets three people to negotiate against each other. So Phil Knight went over there and strategically went to each county precinct and put 10 factories in 10 distinct local geopolitical areas of China. Mm -hmm. So if anybody started getting tough with them, he just said, oh, I'll just move your business to the next province. And so it was that they all kept each other in line because no one wanted to lose right. the business. Yeah, good and, and I don't think I've ever heard of a single dentist in his life playing three real three landlords against each other uh, lowering the no, price. No, because, because since you don't know, if the yeah. landlord says this is the deal, like I said, you either say okay or you do a little bit of negotiating in a vacuum. But like I said, it's in a vacuum because you don't, you know, if you're going to go buy a new car, there's a myriad of websites that you can look up and find out the market value of that car. So in theory, it's not rocket science to get the best deal on your new car. But in our business, there is no, there is no website that you go to to find out what the rent should be, how much free rent should there be, what should the annual escalation be, am I gonna get a death and disability clause, do I have a good assignment clause, there's no book for this. No. There's no, no. way to know it. And theoretically, you don't have the time to worry about stuff like that, too, because you're busy working as an associate, building enough money and equity to get the loan to start the practice. That's right. So you're, you're busy every day. I mean, I, I have a ton of clients. It's very difficult to schedule tours of properties because they're only either available on weekends or after 5 o'clock. Right. And guess what? Uh, office brokers, retail brokers, they're not working. They clock out at 5 o'clock, and they don't work Saturdays. So, you know, usually we, we have to compromise and say, well, you know, take half an hour to an hour on your lunch break. Let's go see two or three properties and then, you know, we'll do it another day. But you just don't have the time to do it. This is our job, our career. We, we have the time to walk you through it. And some of, the, some of these small towns are very weird. Like the dental, on Dentaltown, stories going back to 1998 where they had this eye on this little building in this small town in the Northeast and they had all these visions of buying it and putting a nice little dental sign and a monument sign and a lit sign. And then after he buys it, he finds out he can't get zoning to approve right. anything. Mm -hmm. And he's basically in some dark building that looks like grandma lives there. And and I, and I this one guy, I'll never forget it, he was so mad on Dentaltown. So he put a lit sign inside the window, and she even they even shut that down. They said, "No, you don't get it. You you can't have any signage. You can't, you know." So they do, they don't know the ins and out of all of there's that. Zoning, either. there's parking, there's all kinds of things like yeah. that. That's exactly right. So to further on what you said, so after we have found the space, after we have negotiated what we think is a good deal, there's still a lot of other things to be done. You need, you, you know, you're a professional, so you're going to want to have an attorney review the lease or the sales contract. But you want the right attorney. You don't want an attorney who's just going to take a bunch of your money who's used to doing, you know, some other type of transaction. You want lawyers who are very familiar with commercial leases. And you have several on Dentaltown who do that. You want the right accountant. You want, you know, you, you want the right contractor. You want the right equipment rep from Bank of Shine, Patterson, Tri-State, Pepco. I mean, it's all the team. So one of the other things we do is we help them assemble this team to make this happen. Because on their own, that's very difficult to do. How would you know who to go to? I just went Trump's physician. <laughs> My God, he's, that was the best physical in the world. A five-minute handshake. Um, <laughs> by, by the way, uh, um, so do you mostly work individuals? Do you do these for the big boys? I mean, there's, there's 35 corporate dental offices that have 50 right. or more locations. We're, we're right now, we're doing primarily individuals. And, and the main reason is most of the DSOs almost exclusively go retail. And the, 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 the powers that be at the DSOs seem to think that because they're going retail, they're better served with a, a broker that strictly does retail. I, I don't necessarily agree with that because most of the retail brokers are doing more restaurants and those type uses. So we, I think our knowledge of the dental profession would make us a better choice. But so far, we're helping, we're helping some MSOs, which is the medical service organizations. We've done a little bit with DSOs, but for the most part- You should, you should lecture for the DSOs. They, they meet here every, uh, they usually meet right, here four they, times a year. They have, right, they do, right. Have you ever thought about talking yeah, about Yeah, oh no, we're, we're that's, yeah. that's on the list. Um, so then, how do you save medical and dental professionals money? And how do they pay when they call you up? Is it a retainer? Do you get a percent of the lease? How, 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 does, how do you save them money? So we don't charge them anything. 
we charge them nothing. And I'll let Chaz explain. Yeah, and I mean, in, in the commercial real estate business, as well as really the real the estate business in yeah. general, uh, it's typical for the landlord or the seller to pay the real estate commission. So we, as the dentist, that'd agent, be the same in a, in a residential house. Yeah, yeah, correct. To my yeah. knowledge, it is. Yes. Sir. Yeah. So if you own your house and you are selling your house, you're going to pay both brokers on the deal their commissions. The buyer's not going to pay that. It's similar in our business, and. Uh, really, I mean, whether you're leasing or purchasing, you know, we're going to get paid percent value on the overall value of the deal. So if it's a five-year lease, ten-year lease, it's the rent over that term. We're getting paid a percentage of that. So nothing is coming out of the dentist's pocket. So the question, how do we save the dentist's money? I mean, it's a very broad question. It depends on the, the situation. You know, it, it, not every situation is going to be a startup. Uh, a lot of times we get dentists who are renewing their lease after 10 or 15 years uh, retiring and they're trying to sell their practice. So they need to either assign the lease to the purchasing dentist um, or a new lease is going to be draft, drafted for them. Uh, and almost every case, the lease is going to be too much and the purchasing dentist size, so they're going to try to renegotiate with the landlord. We, we do that as well. Uh, so it really just depends on the situation, how we save you money. I mean, we're going to save you money, whether it's for construction costs, because we're going to always ask for more money from the landlord to help build the office. Uh, we're going to ask for more free rent. We're going to ask for a lower rental rate over the term, lower escalations. There's a lot of different factors. But you know what? Um, Some of these leases are 60, 100 pages with the institution. So there's, there's more parts of the deal than we have time to go into. But the basic guts of the deal are the rent that the dentist pays, the free rent that the landlord gives them, the annual escalation on the lease, and the amount of tenant improvement dollars that the landlord gives the tenant. So obviously, as the dentist fiduciary, we're trying to get the lowest rent, lowest escalation, the most free rent, and the most tenant improvement dollars. But the key to that, the key to that is knowledge of what landlords are going to do in that particular market. They're very, they're interesting people to say the least, okay? And if you've got a 180,000 square foot shopping center with all these national chains and stuff, you're not that excited about the 1,500 foot pediatric dentist anyway. So you're not really bargaining from a position of strength. So knowing what the floor is, is how we're gonna save money. Right. So if we save you money in base rent, if we save you money in what you pay every year on an es escalation, if we get you more free rent and we get you more tenant improvement dollars, that whole package adds up to a lot of money over time. And you know, so much of this is culture-based because I, I think I've learned really the most by going to other countries. Like when you uh, go to Scotland, I mean, they, they say that wire was invented by two Scots fighting over a penny. And it's true, you go to dinner with six dentists from Scotland and they're going over the bill, like an accountant, like, well, I just had a nice tea, you had, a, you had two beers. And, you, and finally I'm like, I'll pay for the damn dinner because I don't want to sit here and do the math for an hour. <laughs> and um, uh, I think all the Scots are having two beers, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> but but some like before I go, I go, 100, I go 100 miles south of the border here in Mexico, and everybody loves to haggle on prices. But I know my American homies; they hate, they don't like, they don't like any of that. They don't have the stomach for it's it. Very true. Because yeah, they don't point. have the culture no, for it. Point. Um, th does it give you an ulcer uh, doing this with landlords? It, it, it's a, it did. Um, and then we've done it for so long that we kind of expected. So now you're dead inside. Acceptance. <laughs> I've reached acceptance. Yeah, I, I mean, no, it is very cultural. No, I, I mean, I have, I have a ton of Indian clients, especially, I mean, the big markets, you're, you're going to get all kinds of different backgrounds all and ethnicities, walks of life, for sure. all walks of life. And, and, you know, a lot of times I get clients who, who try to renegotiate the deal after the basic terms have already been agreed on. And we just have to tell them, look, this is not going to go over well. You know, you don't yeah. want to upset the landlord in this situation because they're likely to say, you know what? It's 1,500 feet, it's 2,000 feet, it's not worth my time, this guy isn't real, and just walk away altogether. And it's really not worth trying to get that extra 50 cents a square foot. Remember because that, you're, you're gonna remember Arm little... and Hammer? Uh, not, sure. not the guy who invented the baking soda, but the founder of Oxnell Petroleum. Sure. I mean, he was one of the richest men of the time when we, you and I were little. Yeah. And he was uh, into prize bulls, and he negotiated buying like the bull. 
and he gets in his corporate jet, he flies all the way over there, and that Texan, knowing he's emotionally committed, knowing he's flying over, raises the price, and Arm and Hammer never bought that bull. He said, you know what? You just pissed me off so much. And he had billions of dollars, but it's the culture. It was just not well, there's acceptable. Well, there's also, there's a way to, um, you know, to, to quote Trump, you know, his, his, his book, The Art of the Deal. There's a way to do this. There is a process. And our understanding of the process is huge as well. Chaz made a great point. So you've got the deal negotiated. The landlord goes and pays his attorney to produce a lease. You give the lease to the dentist, and then the dentist wants to start renegotiating the whole deal. Well, there's a very good chance, like you said, the landlord says, you know what, 1,500 feet, forget it. Mm -hmm. Forget it. They don't have to give you the space. Until the lease is signed by both parties, offer and acceptance, and you write a check for the deposit for consideration, you don't have a legally binding contract. So you need to you need to play ball with these landlords within the confines of how you play ball to get what's best for both parties. And that's as a broker by definition, we 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 go between the two parties. And yeah, it can be stressful. But you know, um, Trump's book, um, you know, I don't like to talk about religion, sex, politics, right, violence, exactly. no politics. But <laughs> Trump's book, Art of the Deal, there were some great takeaways in there. One of them for me was. Uh, I don't care about the price. He goes, I'll buy your home for a billion dollars if the terms are a dollar a month for a billion year, right. a billion months, because I'll, I'll rent it for a dollar and rent go. it out for a thousand and make $999 a month. He goes, exactly. it's never the price, it's the terms right. and the interest rates, which I think my homies as a dentist understand the rent, they understand the free rent, tenant improvements, there's an amount, but what, what do you mean by escalation of rent so, price? So every lease for the most part, every year, the rent goes up. Reason being that when you own commercial real estate, you're a developer, you go out and develop a 200,000 square foot shopping center, you take the risk, you borrow the money from the bank, it's empty, now you have to lease it. The market says that your payback for taking that risk is that in these leases, every year the rent's going to go up. That's how you're making money by owning this real estate. Okay, that's why. So, that's why so Chaz that's, mentioned. So the Chaz, real estate's appreciating. Yes, and because the rents are going. The rents up. are going up. Does that have anything to do with the uh, the inflation or interest yes, rates yes, or no. growth of the economy? It's almost a hedge against inflation because regardless of what the economy is doing, if you own the shopping center, <laughs> it's going up every year. That's your that's your hedge against inflation. But Chaz alluded to it earlier. That's a compounding. I always like to say compounding interest is. When, when you talk to your financial planner, he or she tells you the power of compounding interest. It's a great thing when you're saving your money. It's a bad thing when you're a dentist because the rent goes up, and so if it goes up 3%, then the next year it goes up another 3% on top of that. So almost always when the lease is up, the rent is going to be significantly over the then market because of that compounding interest. That plays back into the lease versus purchase, because if you can buy and you can lock yourself into a lower interest rate over the next right. 20, 25 years, it makes a lot more sense than leasing that space for 10 years and paying 3% bumps right. uh, on, on that term. So, what, so and, and those bumps, it, it depends on the market. Yeah, it, it depends, depends on, on the market. market. So like Pittsburgh, uh, you know, I've seen leases where it, it'll stay the same for the first five years, and then from year five to six, it'll increase 5%. Per and, year? Uh, uh, no, not per year. Just just that one increase, and then you got that rent for the next five years. So yeah, a lot. Some of it's inflation. Uh, some of it's just to cover increases in taxes and operating expenses of the building. But the majority of the reason for the increases is just uh, in investment in real estate. So the landlord can make money. It's a, it's a supply and demand business. There, it's not rocket science. So so the, the higher the demand the more the rents go up. It's just that simple. And, and we see different markets. One of the hottest markets we work in is Houston. Houston's on fire. It the is. rents are huge. The escalations are huge. Like Chas said, we did it on Cranberry Township in Pittsburgh. The rent was flat for five years. That's unheard of on the East Coast or the West Coast, mm -hmm. the rent to be flat. For, but they're so desperate to get a tenant that they did it. So it's all very much market driven. And so it's all supply and demand. That's all. It God, is. I love that Three Rivers area. Pennsylvania is a very beautiful state. Yes, it is. It is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's amazing how um, when you fly into Pittsburgh, you think you're out in the country. 
and then you just make like one turn or through a tunnel or through a grove and boom. Yeah, yeah come around the mountain cool and there's the city. Oh setting. my yeah. God. Cool I mean, you city. go from like, I'm out in the middle of a forest to holy moly, so look true. at that. It's that is so just true. a, so, so an another big um, thing you're thinking, you know, when, um, when I I'm 54, so to me, 10, 20 years, I mean, it seemed like a long time. But when you're 25, and they're thinking, they're saying, well, do you want a five-year lease? Or when, when you're 25, a five-year lease is one-fifth of your life. Right. A 10-year lease is damn near half your life. Right. When you're 55, a 10-year lease is only one-fifth of your life. So they're always thinking, man, do I, do I want a five-year? Do I want a 10-year? What, what you know, talk about how, how long would you go? Well, we, we usually advise startups who are associates for maybe two, three, four years going to start a practice to sign 10-year leases. And there's, there's several factors. I think one of the main ones is the concessions from the landlord. Uh, generally speaking, it's going to be double just because it's double the term. So you're going to get double the money, double the free rent. Not necessarily a lower rate. It might help, but generally the rate is the rate for the market. Um, and then the other thing is if you sign a five-year deal, you're probably – if you, you, you well, first of all, if you sign any term, you need to ask for a five-year renewal option on top of that as well because without that – you know, depending on how the market's changing, the landlord can say, you know what, this guy's paying 25 bucks a foot. There's all this development. Uh, I kind of want to put a five guys in there and charge them 40 bucks a foot. So if he doesn't have that security in his term, guess what? You're gone if you don't have that option. So I always try to but get. What was the option of first order refusal? So no, a five no, guys. No, 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 no. So you say you, you, you want to negotiate in addition to the lease term you want to have a legal option to renew your lease so that even if the landlord may want to put five guys in there, he can't. You have the right to stay there another five. Correct. Right, right of first refusal, that's a different animal. But the option to renew, what Chaz is talking about, is that so if you do a 10-year lease with a five-year option, we usually try to ask for two five-year options. And again, that's the dentist option, not the landlord's. So you don't have to stay. But if you want to stay, if you have a 10-year lease with two five-year options, you're good for 20 years. Yes. And don't miss your window because a lot of times it'll say in the lease you only have 90 days notice to let the landlord know you're going to renew. Sometimes it's, it's longer. Sometimes it's a year. So if you miss that renewal notice, now all of a sudden that, that space isn't necessarily yours. You have to renegotiate. I, I want to go to uh, <clears throat> switch gears to uh, um, tenant improvements. Um, you know... I, I don't know how the market changed, but 29 years ago, when, when my landlord, when I, when I signed my lease, the going rate was $20 a square foot for three years. Okay. So I said, well, um, and then he wasn't, or he was just going to give me a, a small amount for 10 improvement. Mm -hmm. And back then I um, got my office designed by HealthCo, which mm -hmm. is gone. Sure, they and they uh, had it all plumbed and everything for these four equipment. And I'm... Um, HealthCo, I went and picked out all my equipment, and they said, okay, this is awesome. We, we're going to get this big sale. Give us 90 grand. I said, well, I actually don't have 90 cents. So <laughs> I want you to lease it to me for seven years, and then at the end, I'll give you a dollar, and I'll own a lease to own. And they were not happy at all, but they wanted the business, so they did it. And then my landlord, I went, um, the, the, um, the HealthCo designed the floor plan. I went to a, um, an architect, you know, all this the, for the, the tenant improvement. And... Um, the, the tenant improvement, he was only giving me like five grand. So what I did is I took the difference and I raised my rent. So instead of $20 for three years, I went back and I said, I want to pay $25 for five years mm -hmm. and you do the build out. And he said, yeah. So I actually got into a dental office with no money down. I got the equipment, a seven year lease to own. My landlord did that. Was, was that something from the 80s? No, no, no. Do you, you still no. see that in 2016? You're, you're, a, you're obviously a smart, shrewd negotiator, and that's smart. But the only thing you missed is when you did that, that's what you did. It sounds good. It probably was good. But you didn't really know what the market was. That's the key. So tenant improvement, there's a market for tenant improvements. In other words, in a particular little area, landlords are giving 20 or 30 or 50 or whatever. Where I'm doing a deal in Maryland where the landlord is doing a turnkey. So it's, it's an OBGYN office. It's going to be $110 a foot. The landlord is paying the whole thing strictly because there's nothing in this market but supply. It's a, it's a dogfight. So in order to get the deal, the landlord has to pay for the doctor's entire build out. 
So what you did is smart and you can negotiate and it's all kind of six and one half dozen, the other I'll pay a little bit more, you'll give me a little bit more and all that makes sense in a pure math equation. But the key is what can you get? How much can you really get? But but if they but like you were saying earlier, if they wanted more build out, if they sign a ten year as opposed to a five year, they might get enough build out to they might they get more ten improvement, they might get the whole build out. Maybe not the whole build out, but definitely more, a lot more. Twice twice as much by twice, twice, as, twice, as, twice, twice as, as much by a twice as long lease. Right. Landlords are shrewd and most landlords like the dentist to have some skin in the game. So if you're in most parts of the country where the construction is going to be in that, let's say, 100 to $120 per square foot to build a dental office, most landlords don't want that to be all of their money. They want the dentist to have something in the game as well. Some skin they, they, in the they, game. Yeah, they feel better that way, yeah. which makes sense. Um, I, want to, I want to turn this conversation around on you. Um, what would you say is that three, 20 years of doing this, you've done 200,000 square feet. What, what are the top three mistakes would you say they they make by the way what do you, what do you when you're negotiating with a dentist what do you what do you tell a dentist with two black eyes what do we do what, what do you what do you tell them nothing two, two you, black eyes you've told them twice <laughs> <laughs> i mean three, that's job. three big mistakes uh legal is a big one uh, the the attorney that you're hiring to represent you, whether it's for the sales contract or for the lease review, you really need to be careful with who you're who you're hiring because you know if you're from a big market like D.C. or, or New York, I mean one in every three people is a lawyer. Okay, so they're all going <laughs> to say they can do it, but legal review of lease and sales contracts and real estate is a totally different animal. You know if you if you aren't familiar with those kinds of contracts then you could be paying a lawyer $350, $400 an hour to, really to get nowhere because the deal's never going to happen. And what, what makes me mad about that is the dentist knows that in healthcare. You wouldn't go to an ear, nose, and throat right. to do a root canal. You it's wouldn't go to a analogy. gynecologist to fix analogy. your prostate. It's a great analogy. But these guys say, well, well at church, one of, one of the guys at my church is a lawyer. I, well, one of them's a doctor. Who, who cares? Right. You need someone that... Just works on this part of the body. And yep. sees leases all the time and knows what... So how do they find that guy? Well, if, if it's us, we can make recommendations to people in that particular market who work, who work with dentists and see those kinds of leases. Again, that's not really public knowledge. And Chaz is right because lawyers like to get... You know, they want to charge by the hour. So a lot of them are going to say they can do it when they can't. And they're going to cut their teeth on the dentist. Meter. Yeah, Makes no sense. I, I think the average associate who comes to us looking to start a practice has been looking for at least a year, usually between a year and two years. Mm -hmm. As soon as they hook up with us, they're seeing their first patient within nine to 12 months. It's a nine to 12 month process. Yeah. And if they're serious, we're going to make it happen. And what right. percent of those dentists that you've met are crazy? <laughs> um, the dentists are probably uh, uh, less crazy. We work with dentists, doctors, optometrists. So I would say that the, the, the doctors are probably the craziest. The dentists and optometrists are probably the, close. The veterinarians are probably be pretty crazy too. The can be, yeah, we work the with vets too. Yeah. The, 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 the second mistake they make is you mentioned the term. So a lot of these startups are a little nervous, and I get that. You know, it's a lot of money. It's a big investment. So they actually say to me, can I do a three-year lease? Why? Well, because I'm not sure it's going to work. Well, the problem is you're going to borrow all this money. Most banks won't even give you the money on a three-year lease. If they do, the terms are going to be terrible. And the reality is you have a 99.9% .9 chance of being successful. So it is going to work. And then if you do a three-year lease, guess what's going to happen if, if you even have an option to renew? What do you think the landlord is going to do after three years? He's going to stick it to you because he knows he knows you're, you can't, and, you're not going to go borrow another half a million. And you know who gets stuck to the most? In my 29 years observing, this dentist goes, buys the retiring dentist, old man Frank's uh, dental office, mm -hmm. and he buys the practice. And they just have a handshake, monthly rents, 2500 a month. Yep. And then a year later, he comes back and says, yeah, we're going to move that to 5000 And the dentist's like, what? And then he realizes the cost of moving and the new build-out in the whole darn yards I mean, I, I've seen more dentists get screwed by a selling dentist 
Hundred hundred percent. No, you're right. You're hundred yeah. percent. And, and I guess and the third biggest thing, and we we I think we mentioned it earlier on or off the air, is just that dentists are very bright people. We know that, but there there can be a an an arrogance, if you will, that I can do this because I went to college and dental school. And then they're gonna make mistakes, which if I was gonna to try to do a root canal or an implant, God forbid, I wouldn't want to be the patient. And it's really the same and thing. And what was again. Malcolm Goldrich's book with the 10,000 hours? Malcolm, what was that book, 10,000? Uh, um, but anyway, where, you know, he basically wrote a book saying it, it takes about 10,000 hours or 10 years to really master anything. That's right. Whether it's a clarinet, it's so true. a root canal, it's whatever. So, true. so So you're going to go out there and you're going to negotiate with some guy who's done this for a decade. And you've been interested in it for part-time for a year, right. you, you're gonna lose. Well, there's I mean, a think right. about it. Like I said, the average lease with some of these institutions is 85 pages. That's a lot of yeah. stuff. That's a lot of stuff where the landlord can really take advantage of you. A lot of practice sales can fall apart at the closing table right. just because of the lease. The real estate. Well, it, what, it was what, an you, what would you say to a dentist that says, come on, you boys are from New York and DC and Pennsylvania. I'm out in, I'm out in Salina, Kansas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this, are some of these rural locations too small to interest you? No, um, we, we'll try to help people everywhere. Some of them are so, you know, if it truly is a one horse town and there is one building, there's not a whole lot of negotiation because the landlord knows there's absolutely no place else to go. But I think the country has gotten big enough that in most markets, there's usually another option, hopefully more than one. But as long as there is another option, the tenant can get themselves a really good deal. And, and frankly, in, even in that scenario, even if we can't do it that way, we can save the dentist a lot of money by making those referrals to the team members that help this happen. Okay, but okay, so let's say I already had a lease. I, and I already had a 10-year lease. Okay. And now I realize that... Um, <clears throat> it's about to turn 2017 and next year my lease expires mm -hmm. and I, I don't even know what I have. So Which can you usually don't. So it, does he call you? Does, does so, you charge him a fee to read his no, lease? So we want to talk to them ideally about a year before the lease expires. Because tell them about the deal you're working on right now. Explain it. Walk it through. So Howard can understand the kind of savings we're talking about. These oh, are is, this, is this a significant, DC? These DC? are significant yeah. dollar savings. So I, we've got a client in D.C. He's in an office building. He's right smack dab downtown in Northwest. It's two blocks from White House. Per, yeah, probably the hottest area in D.C. The, the market on a new deal there is going to be anywhere from probably mm -hmm. 45 to $47 per square foot on a new deal. And you're going to get 60 bucks a foot from the landlord to help build the office. So he's effectively paying for half or a little more than half of your build out. Um, he's been in his space for, I don't know, what, 20 years? Mm -hmm. So he's been paying annual escalations. He's up to about $54 a square foot. Okay, so, I mean, it's significant money. He's, he is easily over 10 years losing or not losing but spending two hundred thousand dollars more in rent than he should be so in this situation he's contacted me a little more than six months from his lease expiration which is not a lot of time but it's enough time for us to threaten the landlord to move him out and he you know we're not making this stuff up he called us and he said you know we really would prefer to own something maybe need a little more space we showed him his options in downtown DC. There's not a lot of opportunities to own. It's all very expensive. Uh, some of it's new construction, which is a premium. I mean, you're Se talking seven, eight hundred bucks, seven hundred dollars a square foot. Money. It's just crazy. <laughs> uh, so we determined there were no options that to buy. Seven, eight hundred dollars. That includes the land and the building. It's a little office condo. Just a condo. But is that but yes, the yeah, purchase yeah. of the land? Yeah, in theory, in land theory and right. building, in theory, and yeah. build out. Yeah, seven no, no build out. Just land and building, seven hundred yep. bucks a square foot. Are you kidding me? Yeah, bill, it's a hundred in Kansas. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. I know. Right. No, I know. Wow. But this now, great, great point about this. This dentist, he was actually referred to us by a lawyer who we work with a lot, and he called the lawyer and said, "Can you help me renew my lease?" And this lawyer who gets it, like your lawyers on Dental Town. I was talking to Phil Phil Bogart this morning. Your lawyers get it. 
this particular lawyer said to the, the dentist, you need to call Chuck and Chaz because I'm a lawyer. I don't know, I know what you're paying, but I don't know what that is relative to what the market is. So again, that's that team concept. So like Chaz said, that threat. When you're a dentist and you call your landlord or your lawyer calls your landlord or your consultant calls your landlord, there's not really a negotiation because the first part of the conversation was, I want to renew my lease. When we call, we say, Mr. Landlord, all things being equal, we probably don't want to move and we'd like to renew the lease. However, we got to do better than this. We both know this isn't the market and we both know we can move them across the street. And that is what gives us that leverage that you cannot get any other way. That threat of having that vacancy is our leverage to save the dentist a ton of Which money. is why we need time, because a dental office is, is yes. there's a lot of legwork. Right. I mean, you're talking from the time it takes to locate a property, negotiate the deal on the property, get a sales contract or a lease uh, and review that. You're talking four or five months just for that. And then you got construction. Right. And depending on which market you're in, the construction is going to take longer because the permit process just takes longer. Right. So you're easily nine months out from your scene, the time you're seeing your first patient. Yeah, so that's why we ask for a year. Time is huge. So you talk to Phil Bogart on downtown? Right. Oh, yeah. We work with him right. all the time. He's yeah. in our market. Mm -hmm. You know what I always want to ask him? How come in college people would say, hey, don't Bogart that joint? <laughs> did that come from Phil Bogart? It could have. But did he just never pass it, the joint around? It could have. Where did that term it's, come from? It's possible. So, um, you know, dentists are, um, sometimes they're hard on themselves, but I want to ask you, uh, amongst all the other specialties, who's the better business person? Dentist, physicians, vets, chiropractors, I don't optometrists? Think you, you, you can't generalize by the profession. We, we have... We have we have dealt with terrifically bright business people from all all those walks. So you can't really generalize. They're, so they're, you, so they, you, you don't notice any generalization really between those? Um, the doctors probably think they know the most. And I they're think more that, arrogant. I think that yeah. has to yeah. do with the length of school and I think maybe the, the competitiveness to get into medical school. They tend to be probably the, they probably think they're the smartest. Specifically the the specialty doctors. Yes, yeah, for sure. And, Especially and, physicians. Yeah, yeah. Physicians, yeah, yeah. Internal medicine, I right. mean, more so than dentists, but the, the specialty physicians, yeah. Because in my 29 years, just in this town, um, it seems like the dentists and the vets and the chiropractors, better location, better advertising, better marketing. 100%. And when I always see, like, who the hell would do that? It's always MDs. So in my, in my warped walnut brain... I think the dentist, vets, chiropractors, you know, I mean, when I, when I see a great move, it's always a dentist or a vet. It's never an MD. Well, no, it's a good point because if you're, if you're, a, if you're a cancer doctor and you're an oncologist, I mean, you're going to make a living. People are going to get cancer. Mm -hmm. the, the, yeah. the, the internists are going to refer you're, to You're cancer. right. And I'm, not, I'm not, you know. and I'm not talking about like the nine dental specialties where it's B2B where someone says, hey, go find this shitty right. location and get a root canal done. Right. And in MDs, uh, in dentistry, it's about 20% of specialists. With physicians, it's half. But I'm talking about the B to C physicians where they want new patients, they want this, that, and they're tucked away. You can't find them. They're on a side street in some medical dental building. And then, the, you know what the dentist that's in that building always says to me? Well, the, you know, the, the really rocking hot location wanted more rent and would hardly give me any tenant improvement but I found this really shitty location in the basement and they gave me a great deal. So can you kind of say you get what you pay for? 100%. Absolutely. 100%. Mm -hmm. But dentistry, I think dentistry probably is, of the ones you mentioned, probably the most competitive. And I think that competitiveness leads to probably maybe better business thinking in terms of marketing and the like, because you have to be. You're, especially if you're like a general dentist as opposed to, say, an ortho or an oral surgeon where it's theoretically a little yeah. less you know what it's all kinds of different models i have an oral surgery client who's got multiple offices who he really believes that in oral surgery you're not on a six-month callback you go when you have to go and maybe you're going one time in your life so his big thing is he wants a location that's really easy to find that he can do internet advertising and or have referrals but really easy to find because you're not coming back a couple times and so that's and that's so true, and they're so wrong because <clears throat> the dentists have the six month recall, and 
endodontists and oral surgeons, all they have to say is, by the way, if you want me to warranty this root canal five years or this implant five years oral surgeon periodontist, I need to see it every year. Right. And I need to see it because at one year, if it's starting to fail, it might be something I can fix. But right. if you just show up, it's, it's kind of like your car. If you don't get an oil change, you just bring your car back in five years, there's no oil, it's burned up, there's nothing I do. A lot of these dealers say we will only do the warranty if every time the engine light comes on, sure. the schedule maintenance is here. Sure. And these oral surgeons, periodontists, should be telling every implant patient, I need to see you every year to maintain your warranty. The endodontists need to do it because if the endodontists don't do it, they think they're the greatest endodontists in town. But if they see everybody for a one year PA, they, they realize 5% of the root canals didn't heal up. So then they start thinking, what did I do differently? Did I miss a canal? Should I get a, a, a comb beam? But I ask you, um, what are the top three mistakes? You did the first one. What are, what yeah. are more? So we said we said legal, and then we said uh, personality. Term, term, <laughs> term. I think they they oh term they, yeah. they yeah. don't sign enough term because of the fear that they're not going to be successful. So they want that they want they want to be able to catapult out in case it doesn't work, and and, and then that gets them on the back end if they yeah. can. Be, and I, to me, I think the third thing is thinking that they can do all this. Think just like you said earlier, thinking because they went to college and dental school that they can negotiate a good commercial real estate deal for themselves. Yeah, and another thing is just, just pure space. I mean, we, we've done so many of these deals that we know that a, a pediatric dentist is gonna need a hell of a lot more space than an endodontist. You know, it's just a function of chairs. You know, endodontist is really gonna, only gonna need about three chairs. Whereas a general <laughs> dentist, you're gonna you're gonna want at least four, preferably up to six we chairs in your office. So that's why you said your startup. You know, you're you're scared of making a ten year commitment, but well, th these guys hear a lot of mixed messages on dental time yeah. because they mm -hmm. hear all these people saying, right. you know, the greatest regret I have is my not building it bigger. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, it's posting, I don't know why I built this mm -hmm. million dollar Taj Mahal. Right. So what is it? Do more of your clients say, oh my God, I overspent, it's too big, I built a Taj Mahal, or oh my God, I was too scared, no, and, I, I, and I wish I would have put in no, one the, for two more majority hours. majority of ours, I think, are busting at the seams within five years. Yep. Yep. And, and and what they what we tell them to do is is build it plumb it for all of your chairs. So if you've got two thousand feet in a retail space, you're probably going to have six operatories. So plumb all six, equip two. So just have two chairs off the bat. When you need more, go buy more yeah, and grow into and it. and grow into it. But but you, but you said something very very interesting a little bit ago. In your all your deals, what percent of the dentists go belly up? Mm -hmm. What, what percent? Well, we can tell you what the banks know. Um, I've done it um, next year, couple, next week will be my 22nd year working with doctors, dentists, optometrists, and vets. We do an average of 100 transactions a year. I've had one prostodontist go out of business. Yeah. So, so do, that, do that math. I mean, that's Go figure cool. it's a prostodontist because that sounds exactly like a prostitute. He, he was in a, you know what how does that sound so he was familiar? the wrong guy in the wrong market but, but this, this is what I, I i keep telling you i mean you think dentistry is so vicious yet the banks everybody tells you they don't even have a half percent failure rate and then you're on dental town whining that you know last year you only made one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. how many americans would kill for a job that made one hundred seventy-five thousand well, a year it, what, what percent it, it, it's funny you said the banks i mean everybody knows how difficult banks can be okay and they want your firstborn child but yet dentists come to them with a four hundred thousand dollars of student loan debt no collateral they're an associate they're going to quit their associate job to start up an office and the bank gives them another half a million dollars. Now, because, why, why would a bank do that? Because dentistry is not competitive. Right. Would you rather be a dentist or have a hero sandwich shop? I mean, think, I mean, I mean I've been in my location for 29 years, and we were there were about four or five of us dentists that have been out here for that for that long. We're thinking we could only name two two restaurants in Awatuki that were there 29 years right, ago. No, that no. Was, they just all come well, and go. And and, and my it, center, I mean, like right now, I mean, it's always been 25% out of business. And, and, and I'm sitting here thinking, this is why I went to school eight It's years. actually funny right. you said that because we'll have a dentist who will be interested in a particular hot strip center in a neighborhood. And the landlord says, well, I want this trendy restaurant. And we'll have to try to sell the landlord and say, why? 
the restaurant's got like a 30, 40 percent chance of making it. And just like you said, they're not going to be there for 35 years. But the yeah. dentist and, is. And, and name some of these chains that were all that. I mean, I'm, trying, I'm thinking of some of these yogurt shops. Great point. Name some of these great chains that that they're gone. That that are gone. They're all gone. Any of them come to your mind? Those things change. Yeah, retail. TCBY, they're gone, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for medical and dental, retail used to be kind of like putting a square peg in a round hole. It's completely transforming. Right. I mean, now. And you said Amazon's putting massive downward pressures yeah, on huge. them. Yeah, huge. Oh, yeah. Huge. Yeah. So I, I think eventually you're going to see a dentist or at least a medical professional in every shopping retail center in America. And so I can't even. Amazon's going to start delivering a drone, so I won't even let my cats outside because I know they would run up to the drone and get eaten by all the. All the fins, probably true. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it's just, I mean, it's all changing. I, gosh, I just can't. I mean, but the, you got to, but you got to be careful because I, I think I said this off the air. Most shrewd retail landlords have a percentage rents clause. So in addition to your rent, they want a piece of your business. But isn't so. that illegal for healthcare fees? Well, it's funny you said that. I've made that argument on behalf of my clients, and the, and and whether it's true or not, the landlord has backed off. I don't know, but I, I think. I know with optometrist, what the landlord typically says is, okay, they back off on the exam, but they say they want a piece of the of the lenses yeah. and, the, and the frames. So the the, so. the problem with when people um, are watching this in 152 countries is that um, um, they think of their country has this law, but in the United States we have 50 little countries called states. Right. But in most states. You have to be a dentist to own a dental office, mm -hmm. and anything like that is fee splitting because what they had in the past is okay. So I'm a I'm a um, <clears throat> I'm a general physician, and every old fat bald man that looks like me, I send to you, and you do a hundred thousand dollar bypass, you give me ten thousand back, and the state board said we'll take right. your license away from right. that. Mm -hmm. So that's fee splitting. Right. They don't want a general dentist um, sending all of his wisdom to to Harry next door because Harry pulls him off for a thousand and gives you a Benjamin back. So. So the fee splitting laws are so tough, and especially in the concerted parts of the country, like you go from Texas to Alabama to South Carolina, um, I mean, it's just, you just can't do anything. Yeah, but the right. reason the landlord wants Starbucks and or Chipotle over the dentist is because they got upside fee It's because they're getting a piece of that. So the more burritos the guy's selling, the more money the landlord's making. So they're making money twice. They're making rent and percentage rent. So we try to sell the stability of yeah, the dental exactly. profession. Longevity. And, and you're not going to have the turnover because, you know, when a space goes empty, a lot of cost involved. What, so, what about a uh, another feature where um, I did this in 87 is this, you know, again, I don't know, but I said I could only be the only dentist in this uh, Safeway Mark Auto Center. Mm -hmm. And then end up like five years later, a pediatric dentist wanted to go in there mm -hmm. and he couldn't. Mm -hmm. But then I had to tell the landlord, yeah, I didn't, I didn't mean a pediatric dentist, I mean right. a general dentist. Right. Mm -hmm. I'd actually love to have a pediatric dentist here. But is that is getting an exclusive for mm -hmm. I'm the only dentist? Is that still? Oh yeah, there's a, that clause is very common, and it, it again depends on the landlord, depends how shrewd the landlord is. The smarter landlords will say that because they want to rent space, they may give you an exclusive for general dentistry but they won't give it to you for all dentistry because they know they have a chance to put in a pediatric dentist and or an orthodontist. So if they can lease three spaces, that's better than one. So it just depends. Yeah. Again, we find out from our client what they want and then we'll try to get that for them if at all possible. It just depends on the landlord. It, yeah, a, a lot of times it depends on just how big the building is or the complex. 50,000 square foot retail complex, you're taking 1,500, 2,000 feet and you're a general dentist. The landlord's not going to want to prohibit themselves from being able to lease to another dental group who's going to take twice your space, take 3,000 feet, and be a multi-specialty practice. Sure, you know, it hurts you in the long run if that happens, but I, I see a lot of times dentists, it, whether it's an office building or a retail center, if there's another dentist there, they're probably not going to go there because they don't want to compete. Just throwing complaints that I always hear out from dentists. Sure. A lot of them um, are very um, upset. They signed a, a ten-year lease somewhere, mm -hmm. and it turns out that the the patients can never find a parking space. That they're having to go to the the business across the street and walk across the street to go to their office. How do you how do you see that red flag coming? That yeah, you'll get two thousand square feet, but your patients will be parking eight thousand well, feet down the road. Most jurisdictions have a specific parking requirement for medical and dental per the code. 
So you won't even get an occupancy permit if you don't satisfy that parking requirement. So what will happen is, in a, so for instance, let's take um, most counties in Maryland, that's usually what they call four or five per thousand. So at five per thousand, that means with 2,000 square feet, there's supposed to be a minimum 10 spaces allocated for that dental office. Well, if you take the total number of parking spaces in that particular complex, you need to make sure there's enough. So a lot of landlords, if they want to make the deal, they'll tell the dentist, I don't worry about it. We'll be okay. There's a way to make it work. So again, as the dentist fiduciary and their advocate, if we see that there's not going to be enough parking, we would tell them, don't go there. You can't make parking. Just and, don't go there. And they're, they're hearing that word a lot, fiduciary, and I don't think they know what it means. Um, they're talking about on 401ks, and now you're talking about lease. What, what, what do you mean by the word fiduciary? We, we have a legal... Is it a Chinese dish it could or, be. An, or an Italian We, we have a legal and a moral duty to represent our clients to the best of our ability. So we, we, have, a, we, have, a, we have to do what's best for them in this real estate transaction. But can, So can you be the fiduciary for the buyer and the seller? Could we can be, you be a double fiduciary? That, that's delay agency. We could be a delay agent, and if we were, we, we if it was a situation where we were where we were representing a landlord, and the dentist was the tenant and didn't have a broker, then yes, in that scenario, we are a dual agent. We would communicate that to the dentist, and we would tell them, look, we're gonna we want to make a deal here, but we got to tell you, in all fairness, we're representing the landlord's best interest. Right. Now, that's, that happens very seldom. In most cases, what we're talking about here is what they call tenant rep. So we're representing the dentist in their search for space and or their lease renewal. What is your thoughts in general about dual representation? Because a lot of a lot of dental practice transaction people, they say, look, if you don't have dual representation, there's never going to be a deal. I think these, You need to come to me because I'll get the deal done. These are complicated transactions, and I don't know why you wouldn't want representation. I don't know why, as a dentist if you're gonna go sign a lease and you've never done this before, why are you gonna rely on the landlord's agent to do what's best for you when that landlord's agent has a fiduciary duty to that landlord? Well, I think there's there's a miscommunication, there's a misunderstanding between what dual agency is and simply just not having a representative. Because right. if you're calling a sign on a shopping center, that broker you're talking to, he's not gonna be a dual agent acting on your behalf and the landlord's behalf. He's the listing broker. He's got a fiduciary responsibility to the landlord. So if you do a deal like that, you're acting unrepresented, and that agent's going to do what's best for his client. A, du a dual agency, only a broker can be a dual agent. So if Chuck was a dual agent representing a dentist and, and his listing, then he would have two agents working for the company, um, working the deal, and that's how they would they would be a dual agent. But, but, but your point's well taken. I mean, I don't know why in something as complicated as a practice sale or a or a, a real estate transaction you wouldn't want representation. I just don't know why. So would they have to tell you they're a fiduciary or is that in writing? Is that something where you, um, my homies would say to their 401k guy or their lawyer, are you a fiduciary representing me? Is that something legal that needs so to be done? So verbally, sometimes, I don't know. Sometimes contractual, sometimes but, not. But, it, yeah. but at a minimum, you want to have a conversation. Because I see on Dental Town where they say, you know, I went to the center and the guy showed it to me and the guy told me this was the deal. Is this a good deal? And they're asking everybody on Dental Town, is it a good deal? Well, it's a good deal for the landlord, I promise you that, because that guy represents the landlord. So the answer to that dentist is you need a realtor who has market knowledge in that town to be your fiduciary to get you the best possible deal. And, and actually to dovetail on that. So, you know, we get a commission. In that scenario, we get paid a commission. And the commission comes from the landlord. So there's sometimes this false narrative that because the commission is coming from the landlord, that our fiduciary relationship is to the landlord because he or she is paying us. Totally false. The commissions are in the transaction, period. So it either goes to us and we'll protect you and get you a great deal, or the landlord takes that money and moves it from this pocket to that pocket. There's not a landlord in the world who, if they don't have to pay a real estate commission, is going to give that concession to the dental professional. I promise you. I've noticed for my whole life. Well, I Not going to happen. I can't believe we went 10 minutes over. Um, so close this deal. If my homies have a question, how do they contact each They can go to our website, www.medicalanddentalspace.com is the best way to get us, and we're happy to talk to them. And 
We, 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 we basically we're never charging. So of course there's no reason not to talk to them for free because if we help them, we're not going to charge them anyway. So we're here to we're here to give them any advice we possibly can. And should they go to Charles Old and Senile or Young yeah, Newton Bruchas? I would I, I would where, talk where? I would talk to the to to, to, to <laughs> Young and Young and Spry Chaz, but 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 either way they're going to get great advice. We have a team of professionals. We all know what we're doing. And well, I know you're committed. I see at the town meetings. I see you on the boards. We'll you're there, down we'll here on that, vacation. Be there in April. Look forward. And to what it. does they do on vacation? They drive. They, they leave the you. golf course to come talk come to some old, old guy, <laughs> and all which we just out of morbid curiosity. But seriously, guys, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. On yeah. your uh, vacation, I asked you if you're ever out here to come see us, and, and you did on your vacation. That just speaks volumes about your. Thank family. you. Thank you very much. All right, and we'll see you at Townie Meeting. Yes, sir. Look forward to. All right, it's medicalanddentalspace.com. Have a rocking good evening. Thanks, Howard.